afternoon in Europe, good morning in the US and in Canada, and of course also welcome and greetings if you're listening from anywhere else in the world in another time zone. Um, welcome to the Alliance of Democracies Foundation's webinar in our series of uh, Defend Democracy, hashtag Defend Democracy. I am Jonas Pearl Kessner, I'm the Executive Director of the Foundation, which is dedicated to expanding democracy and freedom worldwide. And today I'll be moderating uh, this webinar. Our webinar of today is called China's Pressure on Democracies and How to Respond, Transatlantic Perspective. It's a very timely topic. There's an urgent need for joint transatlantic responses to the value challenges from China. The Chinese regime has shown increasing capacity, not just to trample on its own citizens' right, but also to intervene in established democracies. The pandemic has underlined how China airbrushes facts with global ramifications for all of us. And that's actually going to be my first question to the participants here in, in the Zoom seminar. If you follow us on Facebook Live or other social media, you unfortunately can't sort of join this poll. But, um, but everybody here in the, in the Zoom seminar, I, um, I urge you to sort of um, enter this poll here. Uh, the question is, has your overall impression of China improved or decreased during the last year? And you've got the three options, improved, decrease, or I don't know. So um, please submit your, uh, um, your answer uh, to that. And I think it should uh, come up um, so that we can see the, uh, see the results. Um, if we can't then i here they come yeah um so 12 percent of of the participants um say that um that it has improved 82 percent says decreased and we have got six percent that says uh, i don't know i think that reactions here of our uh, participants uh today really sort of just confirm um global polling on this where perceptions of China have deteriorated. For example, a poll from the European Council on Foreign Relations and Tingitang Europa shows that in Denmark, the country where I zoom in from, uh, decreased with 62% during the pandemic. Uh, for Europe overall, uh, it has uh, decreased with 48%. So it's on this backdrop that we discuss China's pressure on democracies. I have uh, four absolutely stellar speakers joining us today. And I will be very excited to um, hear all of them speak. Um, we have uh, Garnet uh, Shinui, member of the Canadian Parliament, Conservative, Canada's uh, Shadow Minister for Multiculturalism, and also responsible for Canada-China relations. Um, among other things, wrote an important op-ed that I read with great interest. Canada is at a crossroad when it comes to, uh, to China. We have Michael Abramovich, the president of Freedom House. Um, formerly with the Holocaust Museum and also earlier with the Washington Post. I had the pleasure in 2018 of doing the prestigious Mark Palmer Forum um, in Washington DC and being the joint host with, uh, with Mike Abramovich on actually more or less the same topic, China's global challenge to democratic uh, freedom, which we did together at Hudson Institute. Um, and uh, Mike, as we'll speak more about later, also experienced China's strong arm personally with, uh, with sanctions. Um, and last but not least, Mike is, uh, whenever I come to DC, a great sane voice in, in, in Washington DC. Um, so glad to have you on as well. We have uh, Uwe Elbeck, who is a um, member of Folketing, which is the Danish word for the parliament. He's a former minister of culture and a member of the independent uh, Greens. Um, and um, we are also, I hope, very shortly joined by Katrina Hamidsbill. I'll introduce her now anyway. We don't have her uh, on screen, but she's also okay. a member of the, uh, of the... Ah, great. Okay, perfect. Um, she's also a member of the Danish uh, Parliament or the Conservative Party, sits on the European Affairs Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee, but also very engaged in science and research, including artificial um, intelligence. Let me also mention that recently, um, Interparliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC, shortened, an international cross-party group of legislators working towards a principal stance on how democratic countries approach China, announced that Katarina Amitsbyl and Uwe Elbeck as uh, the new Danish uh, co-chairs. Um, 
uh, Garnet, you know, from Canada, is already Canadian co-chair in, in IPAC. I think this also shows that legislators around the world in democratic countries are increasingly focus on the growing challenge from China. I'll open it up now to uh, our speakers just for like a very brief uh, intro uh, remark so that um, everybody um, has seen them. As you could see, I hadn't even seen my whole panel, so I'm glad that all of them were, uh, were there. So, um, uh, Katerina, we can actually start with uh, you if you want to just uh, say a brief word of, of intro. Yes, thank you very much, Jonas, and, uh, and for this initiative. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. Uh, we just uh, announced IPAC here in Denmark a couple of weeks ago, so we are still learning from colleagues, particularly from, from Canada. Um, and what is uh, our, I think, our approach is, of course, how we can deal with it from a, like a Danish, uh, Danish parliament, uh, but also from the EU. Uh, also, because I'm an EU spokesperson, so I'm following closely what are the EU's newer priorities towards China and, and Hong Kong, which I will talk about, about later. Thank you. Thanks, Katerina. Ufa, um, can we have you say a couple of words? I know you're on, on your phone, so, but uh, it, it, it's great. To yes, so. yes, for sure. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really uh, curious to hear what my colleagues uh, are going to uh, reflect on, on this uh, seminar, web seminar. But uh, just uh, maybe just a, a quick personal uh, comment uh, that actually when I look back, uh, also when I was Minister for Culture uh, in, in uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, actually I had a very positive picture about uh, China's role uh, on the international scene and uh, and had a lot of uh, optimistic thoughts about how, how can we uh, actually cooperate with China and uh, this has been really a, a personal journey to end up where I am now uh, with a very strong standpoint uh, when it comes to China and the way chi the role China plays on the international scene and uh, that comes back to your opening question, uh, Jonas, that uh, actually what I've seen is that the problem has just uh, uh, developed uh, quickly over the last couple of years. The, uh, we see uh, China's role as uh, really a negative force when it comes to human rights and uh, freedom and the democr democratic uh, attitude. So I'm, I'm looking forward for this conversation. Thank you. Uh, so next in, in line in my little panel here, I have uh, Garnet uh, Shinui, um, and I, I hope I pronounced the, the last name correct. Uh, I give it a uh, bit of French touch. Th thank you very much. It's, uh, it's not how I grew up pronouncing it, but a little bit of French touch is probably good for my uh, long-term electoral chances in Canadian politics. So, uh, so, so thank you for your help uh, reframing that. And it's great to be part of this important conversation uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to connect with uh, colleagues around the world. This is a global challenge, how we respond to the increasing efforts of the Chinese Communist Party to push back against uh, the values of freedom, democracy, and, and human rights uh, on the world stage. Uh, it, it reminds us of the importance of renewing our commitment to defending and advancing democracy in every generation. Uh, we cannot take for granted uh, the benefits that flow from the sacrifices made by our ancestors in, in the preservation and advancement of democracy. We have to be prepared uh, to undertake those efforts and to make those sacrifices in every generation uh, to preserve the, the, the goods of freedom uh, that we uh, appreciate and enjoy. We can never take those for granted. Uh, and I think we are living through a time where because of the challenge presented uh, by the by the Communist Party of China in particular, uh, we are being called upon uh, to think through new challenges, to make new sacrifices, uh, to show uh, courage and resoluteness uh, as we in, as we work to preserve uh, the freedom and democracy that we currently enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Garnet. Uh, Mike Abramovich, um, the intro word is yours. You need the sound on. Oh, sorry, there you go. Um, uh, Jonas, it's great to see you and it's a real privilege to be with your distinguished panel on a very important subject. Uh, I thought it might be useful just to say a quick word about Freedom House's view about China. Uh, we do regard 
uh, the Chinese Communist Party is one of the biggest threats to global freedom. And uh, uh, this is really borne out uh, by the annual surveys we do, uh, both Freedom in the World, which we've been tracking the health of democracy since the early 1970s, and our more recent study, uh, Freedom on the Net. And uh, Freedom of the World, you know, our most recent uh, report, uh, which, which came out about six months ago, just as the pandemic was starting, you know, showed that uh, China was one of the 15 lowest performing countries in the world and uh, in terms of political rights and civil liberties. And they were among other things, uh, just a handful of countries that were flagged for ethnic cleansing, uh, uh, which is related to the horrid treatment of the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang province. And of course, with respect to the internet, uh, ever tightening censorship and expanding surveillance makes China the worst performing country in freedom on the net. Uh, the great Chinese firewall is getting stronger and, and you'll see that when our next report comes out next week. So we're very concerned about what's happening inside China, but the, but the purpose of this discussion really is the incredible efforts of China to kind of export the tactics of repression beyond its borders, which I'm looking forward to talking about with uh, you. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Jonas. Thank you, Mike. So great. Now you have, as you, uh, I think all of you listening in uh, with me, we have this sort of stellar uh, cast of speakers. So I'm, I'm really excited to get into the, to the dialogue. In order for it not to be sort of too broad, we've actually subdivided it into three themes, which our speakers will address. First, we have a theme about how to counter China's coercive diplomacy against Canada. Um, and then we have one on Hong Kong's final breath. Um, have we done enough? Um, and then we have a third segment on freedom of expression under pressure from China. Um, and in the, in the first section, we have um, Garnet, of course, from Canada that will be leading that. And then in Hong Kong, um, it will be uh, Ufa and Mike Abramovich. And on the final uh, segment, it will be Katerina that will be in, in the lead. But we will, of course, also open it up for uh, uh, debate subsequently. So we start with our first you know, theme, how to counter China's coercive diplomacy against Canada. Um, short, I can just say that in Canada, attitudes are changing too on China. Canada's foreign minister's top priority is the immediate release of uh, two Canadian citizens who were arbitrarily de detained by China, um, so-called sort of hostage uh, diplomacy. And, and definitely my view is seen as an affront, not only to the rights of these individuals, but to all liberal, uh, democracies and sort of the values that we uh, represent. But um, we'd love to hear uh, from a Canadian on, on these issues and, and, and how you, uh, you, you deal with China. Well, well, thank you very much. And I think the best way to start uh, this kind of appeal to my colleagues from around the world to just recognize the, the importance of Canada's experience in particular uh, is with, with that a classic quote from uh, Martin Niemöller, who is a, a German pastor during the Second World War, speaking about the importance of of solidarity with those that are that are facing injustice. Uh, he famously said, first they came for the communists, and I did not speak because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Uh, then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. Uh, what we see from the government of China is an, an effort to push back against uh, human rights, international law, uh, norms of, of uh, basic decency. Uh, we see those efforts on so many different fronts all at once. Uh, coercive diplomacy, uh, 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 arbitrary uh, hostage taking vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship with Canada uh, is one example as part of a, a large swath of actions. And if we don't uh, work together across international borders among uh, free nations and freedom loving peoples to counter this together, uh, then, then uh, we leave ourselves vulnerable to sort of being picked off one at a time. And we know that the, the, the government of China loves to play these games where uh, you're in the in the doghouse one day while everybody else is doing well and then the dynamic is flipped and it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism for exerting pressure. And part of how we push back against that is uh, as, as free nations, uh, as, as uh, people seeking freedom, we, we work together as much as possible uh, that, that we uh, create our own so-called united front uh, to respond to the, the pressure uh, that, we're, that we're seeing. 
Uh, so just I mean, a quick, quick, quick story in terms of, of how we got here in Canada. Uh, we had a, a new Liberal government elected in 2015. And uh, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Conservative opposition. So I don't always agree with the government, but we, we try to work together uh, on international issues when we can. Uh, in, the, in the early phase of this government, there was a strong desire uh, to have closer, warmer relations with the government of China. And uh, we in the opposition were quite critical of, of some of those moves. Those those moves included expressing strong public support for negotiating a free trade deal and even at one time expressing openness to op negotiating a, an extradition agreement with the government of China. Um, that, uh, the, that, that didn't, the, the, the desire of the government to have this new golden age uh, in our relationship with China was not uh, fully realized, but it especially became, came, came crashing down when uh, Meng Wanzhou, who's a, 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 a VP with, with Huawei was arrested on an American uh, warrant uh, while she was transiting through Canada. Uh, she's now undergoing uh, extradition proceedings and it's kind of a long, a long legal process. But the government of China was very upset about uh, this arrest and retaliated with uh, various completely unjustifiable uh, trade measures as well as the sort of arbitrary detention, the hostage taking of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Um, and uh, it, it should be noted that that the, these hostage takings are the, the two Michaels, as, as they're often called, are not the only Canadians detained in China. I think it's important that we that we also remember uh, that there are other cases of Canadians arbitrarily detained in China. I've spent a lot of time trying to to champion the case of Hussein Chalil, who's a Canadian national of Uyghur origin, uh, who who actually was not uh, taken in China. He was he was in Uzbekistan uh, and he was kidnapped from Uzbekistan and sent back to. China. He's been detained uh, for well over a decade without any consular access. Uh, so there are there are multiple cases, but probably most known to the public and in direct retaliation for the for the arrest of Meng Wanzhou uh, is the uh, the the de de detention of the, the the two Michaels. And and really, there's there's just absolutely no parallel in terms of of the response. Uh, Meng Wanzhou was arrested uh, lawfully. Uh, she's out on bail. Uh, she she can't leave the country, but she's 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 on bail. Uh, here in Canada, whereas the the two Michaels are in in uh, conditions that amount to torture, uh, I don't think anybody takes seriously the 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 alleged charges they they face, and they haven't had consular access during the the period of uh, of, of of COVID nineteen. So, it, it's it's a really dire situation, and it, and it just shows the the lengths that the government of China will will go in terms of. Uh, trying to bully other countries uh, to accept its its will, and uh, this uh, I, I think that you know the the government has at at times sort of our government has struggled to uh, respond effectively. Uh, we had a little bit of a misfire where our our previous ambassador, who had been a government minister, said some things publicly uh, that were very unhelpful to Canada's case, and he eventually had to be removed from his position. So this is a you know a, a constant a political debate in Canada where we in the opposition try and and encourage the government to take a stronger line. Uh, but but to the credit of the government, they have they have rejected out of hand any kind of uh, prisoner negotiation type of type of uh, re or prisoner exchange in response to this uh, and, and certainly a, a prisoner exchange would be would be really contrary to our commitment to uh, adhering to the rule of law in this case so uh, we we are in the process of these debates about how we can really firm up and strengthen our, our stand as a country uh, with those of us in the opposition pressuring the government to take strong, clear, principled positions with respect to China. And we need the help and support and engagement of countries around the world, uh, recognizing that the same thing could happen to you, that any time uh, the, the government of China doesn't like the way things are going in terms of a, a legal process or a um, or, or, or economic decision making that the retaliation could be at the form of of uh, the the arbitrary uh, detention uh, long term detention of your nationals even taken from a third country as I spoke about in the case of Hussein, Hussein Chalil uh, and then uh, that person or those people being used as a, a bargaining chip to try and extract concessions from your country you know it. it this is this is where where we're at. This is what uh, the Communist Party of China has clearly shown a will to do. Uh, they're doing it in Canada, and uh, it 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 has happened, and it could happen in any other country. It could happen in your country as well.
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for those uh, uh, strong and, and solid remarks. I actually, uh, based on that, we are also doing another poll here where we particularly are going to ask about sort of the international uh, element of this. So the, the question, which I think will appear shortly and is already on your uh, screen here, do you think other democratic countries should do more to help Canada counter China's coercive diplomacy? Um, and you've got a couple of options. Yes, unconditionally. Uh, yes, but not if it hurts my own country's business with China, or no, or an I don't know option. So, um, uh, so that I think could also give us some good indications um, of where the audience is in this, because then afterwards I would uh, love for uh, Uwe Elbeck, Katerina Amitspul, uh, or Michael Ramovic to come in on, on, on these questions. Okay, we have an audience that's pretty... Uh, solid in its um, uh, sort of we might need to have invited some more China business people uh, along this because what the results we get is yes unconditionally for 90 percent and then it's yes but not if it hurts my own country's business side with China for for 10 percent. Uh, I do think at least there's a little bit of tension there between um, uh, that that I think um, uh, Uwe Elbeck or Katrina might want to chip in from a case of Denmark what, what Kind of what could we do to help Canada? We had it again 10 years ago with Norway, which was sanctioned because of the uh, Nobel Peace uh, Prize to Liu Xiaobo and, and no other countries really did anything. Is, is there ways we can now in this case here with Canada, because this could happen to, to all of us uh, as well. Um, uh, Uwe, maybe you would like to, uh, to chip in on, uh, on this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear my voice. Um, I'm uh, I'm using my my iPhone, so I don't know if it's uh, I'm coming through. Uh, am I coming through? Super. Um, first, first of all, I, I think that uh, what Canada is uh, experience, uh, everyone is experience these days. That uh, China uh, put uh, each country uh, under under political pressure. We saw it here in, in, in Copenhagen and Denmark uh, in the spring, where we had a, a art piece in front of the of the Danish Parliament called uh, "Pillar of Shame," uh, which was a, a kind of a reaction to the conflict in Hong Kong. And what actually was a surprise for me was that uh, China uh, both tried to put. Uh, the local city council in Copenhagen under pressure, but also the leadership of the Danish parliament. They wanted uh, to try to uh, secure that uh, this event would never happen. Of course, uh, the, the response was uh, negative uh, concerning China. We said that both the city council in Copenhagen said, no, uh, this is not your business to decide uh, artistic uh, expressions in Denmark. And uh, I'm happy that my own leadership here in the Danish parliament, uh, the reaction was also straightforward, uh, saying no. So, but, but I really was surprised that, that China uh, actually took our events so serious that they tried to use all their muscles. And uh, that comes back to the Canada situation is that I think what we need is a, a political awareness between us parliamentarians that we have to create this international network uh, where we actually can raise the, our own local media awareness about what is happening in other countries. And of course also uh, speak up for each other when we experience uh, China's uh, way to put pr us under pressure. Uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, on a personal personal note, that uh, I'm really happy to now to be co-chair in IPAC uh, because uh, I can really feel the value creation from these uh, web seminars and the direct dialogue between us parliamentarians. That uh, that uh, it's it's a actually a very political important initiative uh, uh, which we see here with the IPAC network. I'm really happy. Thank you. I have uh, Mike Abramovich that signal for, uh, for a comment on, on this as well. Sure. Thank you, Jonas. And I, uh, I really appreciated uh, Garnet's uh, point. And I just would like to make two points. I think 
the idea of democratic solidarity is really vital. And I think the different countries have to stick up for each other or else we're gonna be lost if we approach this separately. And I just think candidly of a different context, not with respect to China, but with respect to Saudi Arabia, when uh, the foreign minister of Canada was quite outspoken about the human rights violations within Saudi Arabia, you know, I felt that other democracies, including our own, did not really come to her defense uh, in the way that we should have. So I think that this idea that it's really important, uh, it's not that complicated. It's just a matter of speaking from the podium forcefully uh, to support each other. And I think that the second point that I would make is that uh, I think this also extends, and I, we might get into this a little bit later, to the business community. China is not only picking off uh, countries, but they're also picking up individual companies. And so you see uh, in my country, uh, they've gone after the NBA, they've gone after Marriott, they've gone after Disney. And so uh, each country, each company, like each country, is trying to deal with China on its own, when what we really need to be doing is marshalling a unified approach from the business community to say that no, with respect to the values that we appreciate in our own country, we are not going to be pressured uh, by the Chinese government. And so without that kind of solidarity, it will be very difficult to confront this challenge. Well, could I make uh, just a quick uh, comment on that, Jonas? Uh, go ahead, Uwe. Yes, because uh, actually just to, to follow up uh, on the last speaker, uh, to come up, come up with actually some good news from Denmark, uh, because if you if we look into uh, the present government's way of dealing with China, uh, our foreign policy uh, towards China, it has been a bit uh, walking on eggshells, uh, which uh, is very normal uh, for all governments because China is as big as it is, and uh, it has can have a, a big effect. Uh, on uh, on our, our business relationships and uh, political relationships, but what 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 was big news here in in uh, Denmark uh, last week was that uh, the first pension fund in Denmark has decided not not to invest further in China because uh, the way they uh, are dealing with human rights. So we, st I think that that's that's uh, a, a very important news for the international community that the first pension fund, I think actually, it's the first pension fund in in the world who has decided uh, to stop investing in in China uh, because of uh, of a lack of human rights. So that that's the good news from Denmark. Thanks, Uwe. We have now uh, Katrina also wanted to uh, to chip in on uh, on this. Yes, yes, I can follow from Uwe. Uh, thanks. The good news from Denmark. I'm not sure I can continue the good news, um, but I I agree what Michael Abram Abramovich uh, said about a more you can say more coordinated, more systemic approach to to uh, human rights. And um, I wonder if there's something we can look into from what is already there and say, okay, we don't start from square one. We already have the Human Rights Council in the UN. What do we have of peer reviews there? Um, we are starting now in the EU for the first time to have peer reviews. Uh, Bulgaria was discussed yesterday in parliament because I think it's important to also look into to our own countries to say what's the state of democracy in those countries. We need to practice um, what we say and then have a coordinated approach for how we link rights and trade together. We have always uh, think, looked at China and says it's becoming more liberal, it's a great partner and over time they'll become more like us in terms of liberal values. But what we've seen is that that is not happening. And also the interesting poll you just made, uh, Jonas, that the general perception is surely changing around China because from what we see, the problem with China is it's happening on, on various different fronts and the Uyghurs in Hong Kong, on uh, companies, etc. So it's very difficult to, you can say, have that map and say, what's the state of, of rights and democracy, particularly, I mean, alone from, from a, a country like Denmark, we don't have that uh, bandwidth to do that. But I think more collectively, across uh, the ocean with, together with, with Canada, but on, and the EU we had, and also in, in IPAC, I see a great potential in IPAC that we can, we can do this together. 
Thanks. Thank you, Katerina. Well, I will, um, to, to end this uh, segment before we move to Hong Kong, I will uh, just uh, give the, the final remarks to Kainé. I would say if this, uh, if these Zoom participants were your international audience, you, Canada would be in a very good place with 90% that says we want to stand up for Canada, even though it also uh, only 10% were saying, well, we'd also have to consider our own business interests. So um, I'm unfortunately not sure this is really fully representative uh, also of business circles. But, um, but at least from uh, through this webinar here in the participants, you get a very strong support. Um, well, any... well, well, th well, thank you for that. And obviously it's, uh, it's something to build on. And just to respond to, to some of the points, uh, of course, Canada has uh, always been there uh, in some of the, you know, the important conflicts of the 20th century. Uh, Canada was there standing with our European partners uh, for, for democracy, for justice, for human rights, making those sacrifices. And uh, we, we look to uh, our partners to, to work with us uh, and, to, and to continue to have this sense of, a, of democratic solidarity, as was mentioned. I think the Saudi case uh, is instructive because in the case of, of Canada's challenges with Saudi Arabia, uh, and this was prior to the murder of, of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, the, the response from the American administration, as I recall, was that this is, this is, this is between Canada and Saudi Arabia sort of thing, a, the kind of a, a neutralist approach to this, which, you know, it's, it's uh, so, so building that democratic solidarity in these kinds of cases is very important. Uh, there's been some discussion here already about the importance of IPAC. I obviously agree with that. I think it's also important that we build off IPAC to create the same kind of partnership among governments, because IPAC is a coalition of legislators. The next step is to have the same kind of uh, collaboration happening at the government to government level, not just the legislator to legislator level. It's an important step and we have to continue to build on it. And then finally, just about the comment about business interests. Um, I think we've got a great opportunity to engage uh, the business community around some of the, the real risks involved vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. When, when you have arbitrary detention of uh, of, of people, uh, very often it's it's business people. It's people that uh, might have uh, had uh, certain sunny views about the opportunities that are associated with uh, with with uh, greater trade. And look, I think we want to be engaged as much as we can in a way that advances our values. But you know, sometimes people have these these sunny sunny disposition, sunny views about what what's possible in terms of China, and then uh, then their their goods get seized. Uh, they uh, they find themselves arbitrarily impacted by the uh, by the whims of Chinese state policy, uh, and so I, I think there's there's more durable opportunities uh, in terms of building partnerships with uh, with democracies in East Asia like uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, because there is there is a constant vulnerability not just in terms of our values but also in terms of of uh, business interests. So uh, I think we we can we can make the case about that as well that strategic dependency uh, on the government of China, uh, given the the nature of that political system, uh, is is something that we need to be very cautious about. Thank you, Ghana. That concludes our sort of uh, theme on, on, on Canada. Next theme is Hong Kong. Um, Beijing, uh, China has sort of distinguished freedom in Hong Kong with the introduction of the national security law and thereby making the democracy movement illegal um, and, and using that law to quell the plurality of voices and in particular voices that are not subservient to the Communist Party. Um, so Uwe, I'll start with you. You mentioned uh, earlier uh, how the, the Chinese embassy, you know, put pressure uh, due to the statue outside that parliament, which was um, supporting Hong Kong's demonstrator. I know you've also, which I can add now, been scolded in parliament for, for sitting, uh, even Denmark has dress codes and you were sitting with a support Hong Kong t-shirt and was told by the speaker that this is not uh, uh, the way you're supposed to be dressed in, but I think shows your sort of activist uh, side. But even you who have done a lot for, for raising the issue of Hong Kong uh, in and outside of parliament, what could we do more is basically my, my question to, to you. You need to sound on. First, uh, I would uh, underline that uh, the, these kind of uh, processes takes t yeah, time. Uh, uh, I've been working on this uh, topic for the last uh, two years and uh, started out with a very personal reason because I knew people on ground in Hong Kong. Uh, I was familiar with both Joshua Wong and uh, Nathan Law, the, the, their work with the democratic uh, umbrella movement. 
And from there, uh, I took the discussion into uh, the Danish parliament, uh, raising questions uh, to the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, but also, as you said, Jonas, uh, on the floor uh, to the Prime Minister. And uh, together with local Hong Kongers here, here in Copenhagen, we have uh, we have done several kinds of, uh, of seminars inside the parliament. Uh, we have tried to push uh, the agenda among journalists, and uh, I'm not. I won't say it's our. Re the reason is that we have done what we have been doing. That uh, the Danish media has a uh, higher focus on on China and Hong Kong, but they they have, and uh, during the last uh, half year. Uh, even the Minister for Foreign Affairs has started to come out with more uh, clear statements, not enough, absolutely not enough, but still uh, stepping up his uh, uh, vocabulary uh, when it comes to Hong Kong and uh, China. But what, what I think, and that's also where IPEC are coming in, and uh, uh, I'm happy that now Katrina is... Uh, a co-chair together with me, because up till now it has mainly been one side of the floor who has been focusing on China uh, and they've been uh, critical uh, uh, when it comes to these questions. But because of uh, IPEC and uh, that we have seen now that it's, it has been possible to at least four of the MPs in the Danish parliament are coming from different uh, sides of the floor. And uh, that's for sure something which I really, really welcome because then it's much easier uh, to to come up with a more strong uh, political voice uh, when it comes to these questions uh, we want to ask the Prime Minister and the Danish government. So the next step, I hope, and I'm, I'm curious what you're saying, Katharina, is that uh, I, I would like to see if it's possible to to create a kind of a committee uh, uh, inside the parliament who are able to follow uh, the development both in Hong Kong but uh, also mainland China uh, on a much more ongoing focus. Uh, because up till now, it has been individual initiatives, it has been me, it has been some of my colleagues from the other left-wing parties, but uh, because of IPEC and this constella new constellation, I hope that we can put a uh, much stronger pressure uh, on the present government when it comes to China. Thank you. Um, I'll, before, um, I think Katerina also uh, was called upon maybe to comment on that. But before that, I will have uh, Mike Abramovich. Um, and actually, just before that, this year at the Copenhagen Democracy Summit, which is a yearly uh, summit we, uh, we do in Copenhagen when we can do it physically this year, uh, 2020 was, of course, virtual due to the pandemic, uh, where we also have a strong focus uh, on Hong Kong and had democracy champion Joshua Wong uh, talk. Um, let's just quickly hear from a small little clip from when he was uh, speaking as an intro to, uh, to your thoughts, uh, Mike. I'm convinced that every word come from my mouth today could well become proof of crime at the Chinese courtroom in the near future. Worse still, not only can democratic activ activists and lawmakers who have participated in international advocacy efforts be barred from running election or even imprisoned. NGOs and other organizations, including their personnel and assets, can also be subject to legal persecution. So the development in Hong Kong have changed quite swiftly from 2019. Large-scale protests defying the communist government may no longer be an option. It could be my last testimony when I'm still free. Yes, prosecuted and put behind bars under the sweeping security law. Our long march to democracy will be forced into a prolonged period of... What Joshua Wong was, was saying what I wanted to, um, to sort of uh, ping off to you. Um, I was warned very ominously because this was done in, in June before that this was probably likely to be his, his last international uh, appearance. Uh, and the national security law would come. And then he also mentioned the threat to other democratic forces outside of China, that basically, and that's really where I also wanted to, as I did in the beginning, introduce 
you with the thing that you've been, you were both born in Hong Kong actually, but you've also been personally sanctioned by, by China um, as part of the back and forth retaliation uh, over Hong Kong and, and is now, uh, I, I expect, uh, unable to, uh, to return um, to Hong Kong. So you also have something very sort of personal uh, at, at stake there and shows the sort of long arm of China. So uh, your thoughts on, uh, on this? Well, first of all, Joshua Wong is incredibly brave and he has not backed down uh, in the face of uh, tremendous pressure and state power that's being brought against him and others in Hong Kong. And so, you know, my, my heart is with Joshua. Uh, I, I do hope that he will, he will not end up in jail, as you suggested, Jonas, but I think there's a very severe risk of the way uh, uh, things are going. And clearly, uh, the Chinese government has basically abandoned any pretense that there is a separate system for Hong Kong and is really kind of bringing the, you know, with the national security law, uh, uh, you know, the, the same kind of repression that exists inside uh, China to Hong Kong itself. So I'm very, very worried about Joshua. Uh, let me say, you, you alluded to the issue of me being sanctioned, and I just want to say it's an interesting wrinkle, uh, which I'd like to talk about, but, I, but, I, but I'd just like to point out that that the people who are really suffering are the people of Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, uh, uh, other people who are being persecuted for their religious beliefs, for their political beliefs. Uh, uh, you know, what's happening to me and, and others who've been sanctioned uh, by the Chinese government is just very small relative to the real problem and to the real victims of uh, the Chinese Communist Party. I just, I just feel like I need to say that. But I do think that what happened to me and a number of other people is kind of illustrative of the larger trend that's going on, which is that China is being much more willing to flex its muscles and really target those who are outside of its borders uh, with, uh, with, with uh, repression uh, or with efforts to intimidate them. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. And so what happened is that the United States government imposed sanctions on 11 uh, Hong Kong officials and uh, Chinese officials for the steps to diminish liberty inside Hong Kong. And the Chinese government uh, retaliated uh, by uh, sanctioning 11 American Americans, including uh, uh, six members of Congress, uh, uh, including people like Marco Rubio and Joshua uh, Tom Cotton, and then also the heads of five uh, human rights and democracy organizations, myself, Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch, Carl Gershman of the National Endowment for Democracy, and a few others. So as best as I can tell, this is a mainly a political statement. Uh, other than, you know, you know, Freedom House doesn't have bank accounts in China and uh, they can't freeze those bank accounts. And as you say, it's probably going to be very likely that I can, can travel uh, to, to the region. But I do think it, it, it's an effort to intimidate people. And I think what's really worrisome is that if you start thinking about, you know, the permutations of this, uh, you know, the Chinese have clearly shown that they're willing to uh, uh, grab their own people from other countries, that they've been willing to imprison unjustly, the two Michaels, as, as my Canadian colleague has, has just said. So I, I do worry about what will happen if uh, my colleagues need to travel to a country that may have an extradition uh, uh, treaty with China, how, how, how that country will behave to that. So what you're really seeing, as I said in my opening remarks, is kind of a a real effort by the Chinese government to uh, intimidate its critics, not just within China, but outside China. And again, I think, just to emphasize, it's, it's Chinese nationals that are really suffering. It's, it's students who are studying in universities overseas who have to watch what they say. And, and also, you know, the national security law is incredible. Uh, Samuel Chu, who's an American citizen, uh, has been, uh, I believe, indicted or charged under the national security law simply for advocating, you know, in the United States where he's now living 
for the uh, uh, for freedom for Hong Kong, and that was considered a violation of the national security law. So it's really this incredible kind of extra territorial uh, uh, statement of, of power by by China that really needs to be resisted uh, by freedom loving people. Thanks a lot, uh, Mike. I have uh, I am. Uh, Garnet Genuist uh, uh, that wanted to uh, give a, a brief comment and I also know you have um, an important uh, debate in Parliament uh, coming up so that you will leave us uh, soon after that. Uh, the word is yours. Well, thank you again for this opportunity, and I'm sorry to have to have to leave early. Uh, two points I wanted to make, just particular to the situation in Hong Kong. The first is uh, that it's it's so important for democracies around the world to understand the universal jurisdiction claimed by this law and the implications for all of us. Uh, that the law is written so as to imply to, so so as to imply that anyone in any country of any background uh, who makes comments that are deemed to run afoul of this law uh, could then be be prosecuted and of course that means uh, people are, are vulnerable based on this on the comments they've made when they travel through Hong Kong travel through China uh, but also that they could be vulnerable to being taken from a uh, from a third country uh, so these are are very significant threats to to international norms that are represented by this uh, secondly the situation in Hong Kong the response of the people in, of Hong Kong underlines the deep desire for freedom for democracy and for the rule of law uh, that we see among Chinese people. Uh, some would wish to falsely cast the uh, clash between free nations and the government of China as being some kind of clash of civilizations. Uh, that's, that's a false framing of what's going on because Chinese people, anytime they're consulted, anytime they have a chance to have their voice heard, Chinese people uh, demonstrate their desire for uh, the same things that, that we have, the, the freedom, democracy, the ability to, to have their, their voices heard. Uh, and we see just with the, the powerful response of the people in Hong Kong, that there is that strong desire for freedom. It exists in Hong Kong, uh, it exists uh, throughout China. And those of us who are advocating for freedom, we're protecting our own national interest, but we're also allies of the Chinese people in their desire for these uh, fundamental human values. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for those. I actually, in this segment as well, we have the option to do a, a, a quick poll. Um, and so one of the, the questions we, uh, we had here, um, which could steer so the end of this uh, debate, is uh, should your country add more sanctions on Chinese authorities over Hong Kong? And uh, we have an, uh, no sufficient action taken. No, it doesn't work on China anyway. Uh, yes, more sanctions, but try to avoid damaging my own country's business links. And then a yes, more sanctions, no matter what. And as always, uh, an I don't know option. So uh, I hope to hear again from, uh, from our audience um, uh, on this so that we can see a little bit um, and, and then turn it to, um, next of our so the results here are uh, up and running um it's no sufficient action taken is 15 percent uh no it doesn't work on china anyway eight percent uh and then we got eight percent on yes more sanctions but try to avoid damaging my own country's business links and finally we have the sort of high scorer with yes, more sanctions, no matter what, at 69%. Um, it wasn't as impressive at the 90% on defending Canada, but, uh, but uh, maybe it was because we had a little bit more uh, yes options. But um, uh, Katerina, uh, Amish Bill, uh, yeah. would you care to comment on that? I think it's very interesting to see that. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know for where it started, but I think we see a shift that there's a now get, uh, a greater amount of people who would like to be more tough on China. Before it was, uh, let's understand China, uh, no sanctions uh, because the, China is such an important uh, trade partner. We do see also that in the EU. EU is surely mixed uh, in its views about China because some countries are already quite uh, dependent on China from investments, from trade, where others are more stronger on, on the value-based uh, way of, uh, of having a trade policy. But I think it's very important we start to be uh, stand tough on our democratic values. 
uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to see if we can get a stronger alliance on that within our Danish parliament and um, across parties and hopefully we'll, we'll establish a committee as, as Uwe mentioned. I think um, I look forward to work with Uwe on this because uh, we'll try to bring both, both sides uh, on the, together. Uh, and then how we can move that in China. There was a meeting uh, here 1st and 2nd of October for the first first time in a long time between uh, uh, government leaders uh, in the EU about what are these, what should be our strategic approach to China. And on Friday, we will have a debriefing with our prime minister. So it'll be very interesting to, to listen to what, uh, was, what happened at that meeting to see is also getting a shift there at the top level of the EU to have been more tough on China to stand up. And then how we can support these democratic movements, as Garrett Genius mentioned. In, in Hong Kong, uh, there's surely a risk that we will lose Hong Kong. Um, so I think we need to take it very seriously, because what can we actually do? We don't see any Western country to stand up to really be tough, except for actually the, the US. But uh, EU will be in between. They don't want a, a trade war like with as the US has it wants to still have a relationship with US and China on the other hand they need to take some firm uh, decisions if we're gonna try to um, support Hong Kong because uh, the situation is getting very dire thank you Katerina so this concludes our our second uh, theme on, on on Hong Kong the, the third theme that we are now introducing is um, uh, the question of uh, freedom of expression under pressure from China. We have um, several examples uh, I can mention from like Confucius Institutes, you know, Chinese state-run uh, educational um, setups, but which have increasingly come under criticism in Western countries because they were always embedded in universities and, and often um, if not directly, had an indirect impact on sort of academic freedom of trying to squeeze out certain topics, particularly on China human rights uh, and the like. Um, we've also seen it for in our neighboring country, um, here speaking as a Dane with, in Sweden, with uh, Gui Ming Hai, a Swedish um, a bookseller who was uh, arrested, um, uh, I would say illegally and, and, and have been convicted in China, but most importantly on the freedom of expression part, ministers in, Swedish ministers in Sweden that sort of stood up and attended events and were basically threatened by Chinese representatives for, for doing this in their own home country. Um, in Denmark, we've just had um, an interesting and unfortunate case with a Danish student at the, the Sino Danish uh, Academy, uh, who was forced to apologize after defending um, freedom in Hong Kong on WeChat, uh, WeChat being the, uh, the Chinese uh, sort of equivalent of, um, of, of social media. Um, and basically um, the question to uh, Katerina Amitspil who will, will lead on, on this uh, topic is what are our tools in these type of value uh, fights, legislation, um, other uh, means because uh, in the end, the student ended up issuing a kind of apology uh, that uh, she didn't really want to. And I think is also still living under the fear of sort of uh, different kinds of academic retribution from uh, China. So it's, it's, it's not an easy case if we at the same time want mm. to collaborate with China. No, it's not an easy case. I think the first thing uh, we are starting to realize is that we have maybe been a bit naive. We have uh, had... Uh, partnerships with China in, in research, science, technology, even police in other areas. And we have realized that some of the, um, the research has been used for surveillance uh, and suppressing human rights, even also the, the Uyghurs. So um, obviously here we not need to, to start to, to stop this. And I think that is something which is, al is already happening. And we need to have a a stronger sense of, of due diligence and for all these partnerships that come in, in at, um, at governmental level, at university level as well. Uh, and because China also has um, also, of course, a lot of research and science and, and, um, and development that we also are interested in. But we need to um, have a bit of a, an arm length distance on um, suppression of, um, of human rights, freedom of expression. It's a balance, as I mentioned before, between um, 
politics and economic considerations for, for Denmark and for Europe. Uh, however, EU will now try to make it easier for citizens of Hong Kong to travel to Europe, I mean, to have a positive approach and will grant more visas and develop more exchange um, programs for students. Uh, we, all, we already do see that there is an interest also from Hong Kong as uh, some uh, young active people are in the threat of, of um, losing their, their passports, their visas, uh, due to the security law. Um, to impose sanctions, that will be a tough one. I think uh, there will not be just a one size fits all because at this stage, uh, economically, it's too difficult, but there could be ways of that we are discussing is how can we have uh, rights uh, more upfront? Also, as we are starting to demand, how can we ensure that our trade agreements also have a consideration to live up to the Paris Agreement, as I mean, on climate. So we have a crime, climate, we can have a rights uh, approach as well. So we need to have a smart way to not only to, to stop, but also so how we can have a, a positive impact. Uh, because in the end of the day, we would hopefully not that this build up and, and escalate to more tension. Uh, on the other hand, we would like to see how we can change and have it to open this. Because what is a bit interesting is that in some way China doesn't need to have such a be so tough uh, on um, on freedom of expression on human rights and so on because there's not going to be a change of regime it's not going to be turned over internally Hong Kong will is obviously also that small so why is it such a big country with so much power so much military power uh, power has this uh, you can say a bit of paranoia uh, and being so uh, tough and, and continue to expand. Uh, this is the question that is being discussed. Uh, and I think we, we just see that this, uh, that China has this uh, yes, drive for hegemony, he, 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 power, yeah. And it's coming in, in, in so many areas and also into the social media and into um, and the culture as well. Um, having the long, the long lens in their approach, and that we need to be uh, be very to, I think, be more aware of. I don't think we are totally aware that suddenly we have a cultural festival in a town in Denmark, a Chinese cultural town. What it does to us as well. Um, so um, I think to answer that question, I think there there are many ways. One is what we're trying to do towards China, but I think we also be, be much more mindful about what is actually happening in our own countries because we don't have a, gr a great overview of that. And before we have that, it's difficult to say actually also that what we want to do. Uh, we can look at what is happening in Hong Kong, but we need to look at what is happening here. And also in the Global South. Uh, we should not forget the Global South, uh, particularly from a European perspective, where countries now are sinking in great debt and it's uh, very prone to, uh, to uh, arbitrary investments uh, and loans from, also from, from China. Thank you, uh, Katerina. Um, Ufe, maybe if you also wanted to, uh, to comment on that, since this, the last case I, I mentioned was a very Danish case of basically, what do we do? The, the student in question is, of course, worried that uh, if she keeps picking up, that she, she can't get her degree because it's a double degree. And uh, so it's, it, it's, it's not an easy and has uh, been kind of forced to sort of uh, uh, apologize. Uh, how do we stand up for freedom of expression in these kind of uh, cases? No, first of all, I, I would say that uh, I totally agree word by word by what uh, Katerina just said. And uh, actually, uh, if I should add on it uh, and or follow up on what you said, Katarina, is that uh, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about uh, the interaction between uh, people here in Denmark and, and China on different levels. Uh, we just had a case uh, some weeks ago uh, where we had a delegation from the Chinese police uh, uh, to the uh, to visit the, the Danish police uh, organization here in in Denmark, and that went on at the same time as you saw all the conflicts in Hong Kong. So there's a lot of cooperation going on on so many levels between each country and China. 
And uh, I have just uh, asked uh, through the Committee of Foreign Affairs, uh, how many Chinese delegation have we had in Denmark over the last couple of years? And on what uh, part of the Danish society do we see these delegation uh, in culture, in education, in science, uh, in, in, uh, uh, when it comes to police, etc.? And I think that we need a, a much better mapping, uh, at least here in Denmark, about mm -hmm. uh, what kind of cooperation are we actually seeing going on on a daily basis uh, between uh, other uh, uh, city, uh, cities and China or on national levels or regional levels. So th that is at least something I would like to follow up uh, in the coming weeks is actually to really to uh, deep dive into dive uh, deep into to these uh, issues. The, the final uh, uh, comment where, uh, you raised, uh, Jonathan, uh, about uh, the Danish students and uh, uh, th that person's um, experience. I think any each of us right now are facing a kind of a conflict when it comes to self censorship. Uh, what do we dare to write on our Twitter accounts or Instagrams, etc.? Even here in Denmark, what consequences will it have for me if I really express a very critical approach to China, if I'm going on a delegation trip to China? Uh, it was already raised by our colleague in the US that uh, we see these uh, consequences outside China. So, oh boy. <laughs> we we have a project in front of us when it comes to 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 deal with China. Uh, thank you. For, so, oh, oh boy, I will ask uh, all of you also in this segment as well. The last one here, uh, we also have a poll. So we are asking on this question of academic freedom. Uh, and when you've heard of this um, a Danish case, what do you think should be uh, done? You've got uh, four options as usual. One sort of demand from the government side that the Chinese side refrain from censorship on Danish students. Uh, two, you should rescind that cooperation. Uh, three, uh, just apologize and move on. Overall cooperation in China is more important. And four, I don't know. So let's see what our, um, all our participants say to this. So we have, 82% uh, that want that, that uh, the Danish side demanded that the Chinese have refrained from censoring on Danish students. Uh, and 18% that suggest just to rescind the cooperation. Uh, there's actually nobody that suggests to apologize and, 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 and move on, um, nor is there anybody that don't know. So that's, again, a pretty solid answer. But as I think we had both with the Canada discussion and the Hong Kong discussion, easier said than done than how to implement this in, 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 in practice. Uh, would that mean you would then immediately ask the university to, to stop the cooperation? It's, it's um, uh, yeah, uh, so I, but it's still a great input from our um, uh, speakers. I want to also mindful of time because we're running a little bit over. Uh, I just wanted to have uh, Michael Abramovich, if you wanted any last, also because you're from the US, the US has already taken a much stronger stance on some of these issues, but where there's also discussion about backlash the other way around, that, that research cooperation is being completely resented and, and almost all cooperation with China is grinding to a halt. Your thoughts? Uh, well, I think the one point that I would make is I think the terrain versus China is really shifting in my country. And I think that, I think over the last several years, you've seen a real change among elite thinking, certainly, uh, that, uh, uh, that China's international behavior is unacceptable. You know, it ranges from people who are concerned about their economic behavior to people who are concerned about the human rights to people uh, you know, who may be concerned about uh, their actions on the internet. So I do think that there is a shift in, in thinking about China. I think partly that's candidly captured a little bit by the current administration. It'll be interesting to see if there is a change in government in, in China, what, what, I mean, a change in government in China will come, not for a while, unfortunately, but, but a change in government in my country, if there is one, you know, will, uh, 
will the vice president, uh, you know, continue a, uh, a, 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 you know, this evolution or will he try to, uh, 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 you know, have a reset of policy? I mean, obviously, uh, our country has to work with China uh, on many global challenges, uh, such as global warming and economic issues. So it's not one or the other, but I do think that there is a shift in the balance towards a more skepticism and concern about China's behavior. That's, I definitely see that. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, mindful of, of, of time, we've, um, I just want to thank all speakers for excellent input. It, I think once again with IPAC, which was mentioned several times, that shows the relevance of legislators also in this process and the challenges that China poses to value. And that it's often a whole of society approach that's, that's needed. That's also why mm. it was uh, great to have uh, Mike, Mike Labramovich from Freedom House uh, join us as well from sort of an NGO uh, perspective. And, uh, and as we had last in our case here, which a lot of questions are determined um, in, in other areas like university cooperation, like business cooperation, which was mentioned earlier. So a lot of these value fights actually not just happen between government to, to government, but in, in, in many other uh, areas. Also want to thank uh, the US Embassy in Copenhagen uh, for uh, partnering uh, with us in this uh, event. Uh, your support is highly valued. And I'll promise you that here in the Alliance of Democracies, um, we'll keep the debate going on China and sort of how to avoid uh, authoritarian encroachment. Also want to thank all the ones that joined us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live or on Twitter Live. Uh, on the Zoomers, I, I know I mostly got your input through the polls and those were really valuable. Um, I know we didn't get to sort of take some of the questions directly, but I think a lot of the, when I looked over the Q&A were on these tensions between commercial values and um, uh, human rights, how to stand up. And I think we've pretty well gotten uh, some of those uh, answered, but, um, but so, I, so I thank for, for, for those questions uh, as well. And this is a debate, as I said, that we will uh, keep going. And so with that, I will say uh, good afternoon here from uh, Copenhagen and uh, good morning and uh, whatever time zone you're in, also a good day to you. So over here, thank you. <laughs>